Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Jason. I'm Associate Director of Development with the School of Social Ecology. Uh, and welcome to our stay at homecoming celebration for the School of Social Ecology. Uh, homecoming is about sort of coming together, remembering the people, places, and events that sort of made us who we are. And it's, it is in that spirit that we have uh, sort of, we're celebrating our inaugural office hours. Gives you guys a chance to reconnect with some of your old professors uh, and, you know, apologize for that paper you didn't turn in in 1985 or, you know, thank them for whatever um, uh, influence they may have had on your life. Um, just some, some basic housekeeping stuff. Um, first, I'll, let me just express gratitude again to, to Dan and Ray for, for being willing to do this. Um, it, is, it is really uh, wonderful to sort of bring everybody back together and for sort of giving up some of your Saturday to spend with us. So we really do appreciate that. Um, uh, for those of you who uh, see someone in, in the gallery who you haven't seen in a long time, you want to sort of reconnect with them outside of the main room, we set up some student lounges for you guys. Uh, I encourage you to take advantage of the, the private chat function as well as the student lounges, AKA breakout rooms. Um, you have free reign, you can go in there and out as you wish. Um, you know, if you see somebody send a pri little private message, hey, let's go meet in the, in the 70s lounge. Um, and you guys can go in there and spend some time and then come back to the main room anytime you want. Um, uh, other sort of housekeeping things, it's, it, this is a, you know, Zoom meetings, there's a bunch of stuff in the, going on in your background, please keep yourself on mute. Um, and uh, let's see what else. And that's, uh, that's all for now. Uh, again, just uh, expressing thankfulness to Dan and Ray and the meeting is all theirs. Fantastic. Fantastic. Thank you, Jason. Yeah, welcome everybody. Thanks for showing up. Let's see here. Terry just joined us. Rick Harvey. All you guys. Uh, and I gotta get a, I gotta get Craig's uh, virtual <laughs> background. That is wild. But uh, maybe we could just uh, go around and just you guys could just say a little bit about where you're at and living and uh, any any key memories of, of social ecology and, and then we'll we'll riff off of that. Uh, who wants to start? Uh, Zoom meetings are weird. Howard Leonard. Okay, go, Howard. Yes. Go. Yeah. Yeah, I, I graduated in 1977 and had both of you as professors way back in your early years. Um, I came from... Uh, an awful inner city public school system, absolutely unprepared for college. So it took me a while to get started. But after graduating in 77, four years later, I had my PhD in clinical psychology. I worked in the Seattle area for about 35 years as a clinical psychologist, put together what became the largest independent practice in state of uh, psychologists, psychiatrists, and nurse practitioners. Fantastic. And we did it as a law firm model. So there were partners and associates it, you know, it's made it a little bit unusual that in private practice, you'd still be earning some money when you weren't in the office. I wanted um, to mention I retired Howard. almost three years ago. Thought I would never, ever, ever step foot in California again. But now I'm living in Palm Springs. Yeah, I just wanted to mention to you all. Uh, there's a clinical psychology program in social ecology. That's my update. And uh, Ray Nabako actually did the heavy lifting, writing the proposal and coaxing it through the system. But back in the 70s and 80s, when we used to talk about a clinical psych program, nobody thought it could be done because it's so labor intensive. And, but now we have one. So that's, that's kind of cool. I don't know, Ray, if you want to say a few words or you want to keep going around. Well, yes, if uh, you could just indicate by just Raise of your hand. I'm sorry, I'm not How many of you are in the, come through. Just a moment. How many of you are in the mental health profession? I was, but I'm not. Two, three. I see. Okay. I'm mental. 
the rest of you will have less less interest in this, but actually it's a, a, a serious topic um, for the uh, uh, school and the department. We, uh, a couple of years ago, were able to put together a, a proposal for a new doctoral program in clinical psychology, which uh, the way the system operates and because of the, the importance of having a degree program that has professional credentials, it's extra laborious in, in addition to what other doctoral programs would be. But anyway, we, we got things uh, through uh, uh, smoothly enough at the academic Senate level, but getting resources put in place, <laughs> that's the other tricky part. And uh, Dean Man Nancy Guerra was um, very instrumental in uh, helping us uh, put in place resources for uh, new faculty uh, teaching positions, research and teaching positions, FTE uh, uh, slots. And Karen Rook, who's chair of the department at, at the time, was uh, very, very helpful um, to me in giving me resources to um, get this proposal underway. The proposal is about 100 pages thick, so you're not talking about a couple of pages with an idea. You know? <laughs> um, and um, uh, we got it through and were able to uh, hire a number of new faculty by virtue of this effort with regard to clinical psychology. Allison Zalta, um, who was at uh, Rush Medical Center, University of Chicago, is a trauma uh, specialist. And, uh, uh, Stephen Schuler, who's um, uh, top notch with regard to um, electronic mental health and, and, and other forms of use of technology for mental health purposes. Uh, we also brought on um, uh, Kate Kuhlman, who was uh, University of Michigan, but at UCLA as the postdoc, does extraordinary work in uh, human development as well as uh, um, clinical psychology and damnation in uh, neuroscience, who um, works very extensively on campus with the Mind Institute. Uh, but he's in, in, our, in our department. So we have a, a top-notch neuroscientist focusing on memory, in particular with regard to problems of dementia uh, on the faculty. So this is a wonderful thing. And then last year, we, uh, after the first round of a search for a clinical director, we need someone to be the director of a clinical training program. And the proposal was written in a way that um, I formulated it based on what the top 10 programs in clinical psychology uh, were doing. Uh, UCLA and Berkeley are actually one and two. Michigan's up there, Stony Brook and New York, without going through the whole list. Uh, but the, the development of the uh, proposal for what this program was envisioned to be was, was predicated on what the top 10 schools, top 10 APA and national schools and clinical psychology PhD programs do because it was envisioned that we're going to be a top 10 program. We wanted to be a top 10 program. That's the idea. That's very difficult to get there, but that's the ambition. And you don't get there without the ambition. So finding a, a, a person to lead the a clinical training program, that was also very, very important. The first round uh, did not work out so well, and uh, but it did work out well in the sense that we then did the search again and got someone who was absolutely ideal for the program, uh, David uh, Schiffman, who from University of uh, Maryland, whose expertise is in psychosis and uh, early signs of psychosis does a lot of work with adolescents and much of his work is um, community engaged, which uh, all of you would know from the uh, spirit of uh, social ecology from the, uh, the very beginning has, has given high value to community engagement uh, as well as our overall social problem focus. So bringing Jason on board has been uh, uh, an absolute dream. He doesn't formally come on board until July, but uh, he's already relocated with his family here in, into University Hills while he continues his work at University of Maryland. But uh, formally, he's on board in July, and I look forward to helping him build um, build the program as I ease into retirement. Well, you Which, know, let's let's continue to go around uh, and have each of you yes. take, a, take a minute or so and say a little bit about what you're doing, memories of the of the program or school. I see Tom Clay just joined. He, he used to record our, our band uh, outings at the back lot way back when, when the beer was flowing over there and we had a lot of good times. But anyway, um, 
Olivia, maybe you could just say a few words and uh, remember to unmute when, before you talk. And then we'll just go around quickly and we'll open it up for discussion or conversation. Yeah, thank you so much for having us. I really appreciate the opportunity. Um, I graduated from the social ecology program back in 1997. And um, I was definitely on the route to do clinical work, but I ended up in the education program at UCI. So went to Japan, taught high school English. Then I came home full circle. And now I'm a principal in Garden Grove Unified. But I, I want to share why I'm here. Um, Dr. Olivia, Olivia, your principal where? Garden Grove Unified School District. Great. So then, yeah, at 35 years old, I was on a fast track. Like I wanted to lead. Um, and I want to thank Dr. Navaku. I didn't have you, um, Professor Stokos, but I did have Dr. Navaku. And honestly, I remember that first day and you challenged us. You said, if you're not here to work hard, if you're not here to give it your all, you should just drop now. <laughs> I have never been so, it, it was just like that ammunition that you gave us to know that we were gonna pursue learning and you were gonna challenge us. I will never forget that. In all of my years, I think you've been the one that has completely stuck in my mind. That, that hard work, that perseverance, that be a leader. And so thank you so much. That's what happens with annoying things. They stick in your mind. <laughs> <laughs> but you Thank have, you. Thank you, you Olivia. Would, you would host the um, office hours, and my biggest regret is that I never went. So when this popped up, I thought I have to do it because I don't want to live life with regret. So thank you for hosting. Thank you. Fantastic. Appreciate all you've done. Um, Colette, you want to say a few words? I'm retired now. I, I My degree was in the Department of Environmental Analysis and Design. My background was architecture. Um, I worked as a facilities director on uh, Morgan Hill and in Monterey Peninsula. I was a facilities planner. I also taught college. I'm retired now. I am busy with some friends from architecture school, some fellow female architects, and we're doing research on um, environmental concerns we all have about the planet and how people can change what is going on. And I, 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 I've been widowed twice since I was there. I'm on my fourth husband and um, I've been very busy. I live in Upper Michigan and I'm working, um, I'm hoping to write research. We have the University of, um, I'm in way up north. I work with my husband on the Honka Homestead that is a national resource with the parks and uh, Michigan Tech and Finlandia. So I'm hoping to get some research going and yeah, I'm look, looking for connections with people that would be interested in the same research my, my friends and I are. Fantastic. Thank you. Well, thank you for joining. I see Marianne just joined us. Welcome, Marianne. Uh, sure. we're, gonna, uh, we're just going around and everybody's hey. being, saying a few words about you. you know what they're doing, where they're at. We're, we're gonna, I'm gonna reach out to Terry, who's calling in from Sweden. He's a professor in Sweden. So hey. give us an update, Terry. You're, I think you're muted, Terry. Wait. There we go. There you Hello, go. Hello, Dan. Hello, Ray. How wonderful to see you. Hi, Terry. <laughs> is there any sunshine there at all right now? We had a beautiful day here, but the snow is gone. Uh, it's now about uh, 8.15 in the evening, and it, it's quiet outside. People are socially distancing and, and uh, staying home. But of course, the younger people are out and at the pubs and sort of carefree and so I try to give them a wide berth as I'm making my way into my office or going to my home but it's nice here now it's, it feels like spring the birds are active and um, it looks like a spring image behind you Ray uh, uh, well actually I should swap that one out because uh, that's the uh, that's the back bay um, back bay and I used that one last year <laughs> because it had this ominous uh, photograph but um, let me let me switch it out to a brighter one <laughs> I, you know I should say too that Terry did his dissertation on people's reactions to nature and he has become probably the international leader on that field of research now I went to a, a keynote he did at a conference in Rome a couple of years ago and he just he just uh, presided and it was fantastic so it's great to see 
all the work you've been doing, Terry. Thanks well, thanks, Dan. I should mention, though, that I, I had to follow up after you, so it was, a, it was difficult. Dan was the other keynote speaker, and you did wonderfully. I mean, it was several hundred people there who were listening to your every word. And so it was a pleasure to be able to share a program with you. I was, I was proud on behalf of our school, you know, that you as an alum were, you know, sort of uh, giving such a prominent talk there. So, um, let's yeah, so see. Terry, been uh, thrilled to see your, see your papers uh, pop up on ResearchNet, uh, ResearchGate and other locations. So here, uh, here's a back bay view, brighter, this, this winter, so it's a brighter background. <laughs> I'm in my office, Terry, so I, I'm, uh, it's kind of an ugly wall behind me. <laughs> it's just, <laughs> back bay is a bit better. And welcome to Fran Dickman, who just joined us. We're going to, Fran, we're going to check in with you shortly, too, and Cindy also. Um, let's see, uh, Maya, do you want to say a few words? Hi, uh, yeah, sorry about that. Um, yeah, I'm Maya Saitsevsky. I uh, graduated in 95 uh, with a de uh, degree in environmental analysis and design. Um, one of the um, best classes I had was with Dr. DeVaco and also uh, Dr. Demento. I don't, you were the dean, Ms. Mr. Stokels, and so I don't <laughs> think I had any classes with you, but um, uh, what I really liked about the program was uh, the field study program. I got a, uh, a job uh, from my field study. I worked with um, Parsons Brinkerhoff uh, in Orange. And then um, uh, I started working for the city of LA about 23 years ago. I'm in the Department of City Planning um, and I've risen up the ranks and I'm a principal city planner. Um, and I, I really, I. Uh, we have a lot, actually, probably at least 10 of our planners are from UCI, either a grad or undergrad. And um, so I always I try to encourage um, new graduates to work at the Department of Planning. As awesome. well. well, thanks for joining in today. Appreciate your calling in. And um, let me go over to Jeff Scott. Uh, you know, back in the day, Ray and I had were part of the social ecology football team, intramural team, and we had some real glory days back then. And Jeff was on our team. He was like a star receiver, I think. Anyway, why don't you weigh in, Jeff? Hey, well, I just say real quick, <laughs> it's great to see you guys. Um, you know, it's a long time ago. I, I left UCI in '82. Um, we had we had a a great run of years. I, um, I, I want to say something more later, but just real quick on me, I uh, was blessed to uh, work with you guys and also with Ray Catalano, did an internship with him at the city of Irvine as his planning department assistant. And then uh, th a big thanks to Ray for helping write a recommendation for me to trick the people at Berkeley into letting me in. <laughs> And then uh, at Berkeley, I went to the public policy school there. Um, and you'll like this, guys. I hadn't thought about this in years. We actually won the football championship in intramurals there in the B League. No, <clears throat> yes, we did, but that, it, that was the B League. <laughs> that's right. You know, that's where it was, was the A League fi finals uh, that um, still burns in my memory. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Now I'm old and broken, but, and I can't play anything because all everything hurts everywhere. But, but Jeff, you went to uh, you started working for EPA in uh, Sacramento, did you, or San Francisco? Well, actually, I I I, I during graduate school, I managed to trick them at uh, EPA headquarters in D.C. to hire me, and um, I ended up uh, here in San Francisco mostly, and I am still with the EPA. For the last 30 fantastic yeah years. fantastic jeff i've got your business card that you gave me decades ago around somewhere i'm in my faculty office at the university i thought it was here but um uh, it, it must be uh, at home after maybe we can figure out that email internet thing and do better than my yeah we'll, we'll do that i'd like to catch up ago, with but, some but. of you individually my olivia uh, uh i'll track down uh emails you just send me an email because i really would like to know what you've been doing yeah, and then uh, so I'm a I've been a senior executive at EPA for the last couple of decades. And Fantastic. 
I live in Marin County, which is a pretty nice place to be. And uh, I basically run um, a number of our programs that deal with uh, protecting people from hazardous waste, chemicals, waste management, pesticides, et cetera, for uh, our region, which is California, Arizona, Nevada, Hawaii, the American flag, Pacific Islands, and 148 Indian tribes, which are an important part of our work. So I owe a lot to you guys, but more on that later. Thanks. Thank you, Jeff. Thanks, we Jeff. Need, we need you up there at the EPA. Um, Steve, Steve Wright, you want to chime in? Hi, Dan. Hi, Ray. How's it been? Hello, Steve. Good to see you. Good to see you, too. Uh, again, I'm Steve Wright. I was class of 1989. And uh, right now, well, it's just right now, <laughs> for the last 29 years, I am a, a senior business analyst in the Seattle Public Schools Department of Technical Services, and mm -hmm. I do the state and federal reporting. And so I'm responsible for the uh, basic funding of the district and also for the graduation and dropout statistics and a lot of other stuff in between. And so uh, I... Uh, even though I work in Seattle, I live uh, over 100 miles away on an island, Lummi Island. Uh, wow. I don't know. If, uh, yeah, yeah. It, we it's a long story that I won't go into here. But anyway, I own four acres, and I got a nice little place in this island that has a ferry. And I was telecommuting back in 1999, and it's just you know this last year it's been full full time telecommuting, and it's been easy enough for me. Fantastic. But. Uh, yeah, but uh, things are going really well. Things, you know, uh, like I said, I was just plugging along. I really appreciated all the uh, quantitative work you did. That's what got me where I was. And uh, I also, Dan, I uh, always wanted to say I greatly appreciated your standing up for me and your your uh, hanging on with me because I was difficult at times back in the mid '80s. There, that was kind of a tough time in the program, at least for me. And you so were, I, you I, were resilient and you know i remember working with you on the esl projects ours at ted mm -hmm. yeah we had some good times oh, oh, yes yeah yes. yeah ted sharp yeah yeah that's the thing about him he he held me along the uh well actually a lot of what i do was spss i still do it and that's what ted sharp taught me yeah and i do and so uh, that's that was been big for me so i appreciate that yeah and i want to say that i think i, okay. I think ted might be uh, joining us he was actually originally thinking that it was last weekend yeah we'll <laughs> see if he can call in Okay. Uh, uh, last thing is that, you know, I, I, I came down to Irvine twice, you know, since I'm up here. One time was on a weekend. Unfortunately, you weren't there. A second time, I didn't know it was spring break. You weren't there. So, oh, well. <laughs> well, <laughs> call, you, you know, email, call, whatever, when you, when you get down here again, when we're, we're back to lots of meetings. There you go. In and again, like, yeah. And again, like I said, uh, the one thing that really sparked my interest in, in signing up for this was that I saw Eli, your son, on, on MSNBC. Oh. I'm going... Eli Stokels, wait a minute, you know. Yeah, I'm, I'm getting old. <laughs> yeah, well, like I said, I think he's eight, eight or nine when you invited me to your house. And, uh, you know, I met him, I, well, you must have been eight or nine then. And, uh, yeah, I said, well, that's great. So, congratulations. Yeah, I want to. Eli's had a very, you, Steve. Eli's you had so a very successful career. Appreciate it. Um, also, hi to Daniel and David who have joined us. We're going to come around to you all just to have you say a few words. Marianne, do you want to say a few words about what you've been doing and the good old days? Sure. Um, hi, I'm Marianne. I hey, Marianne. <laughs> <laughs> Great to see so you. Good yeah. to see everybody. I, uh, I finished, when did I finish? 1984. I'm old when we had offices in trailers and you could look out your window and see cows. Okay, you remember um, what the trailers were called? What were they called? Paradise Lost. Paradise Lost. Oh, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> we were so clever. That's yeah. graduate student humor, if ever I've heard it. Um, I'm retired from uh, most recently UCLA, where I served as assistant provost. Um, I spent most of my career doing either research on higher education at UCLA and at RAND and then doing higher education at USC and at UCLA. And today I am the founder and president of a nonprofit corporation called Accidental Impacts, which is the only organization in the world, to my knowledge, that uh, 
serves people who have unintended uh, accidents in which someone else was killed. So they've unintentionally killed someone else, mostly car crashes, but also um, hunting accidents, accidents around the home, sports, all kinds of things. So it's not a very happy topic, but it's important and it's filling a need and I find it rewarding. No, so. kudos to you for establishing that and all the good work you've done. Thank you. Thank you. Definitely. Well, it's we're going to keep coming around to you all. Uh, Craig, you've uh, you want to say a few words? I think you go by Finger Puppet nickname, is that right? Well, I, I remember being called a Finger Puppet um, <laughs> on your football team once. Okay. Um, I came to Irvine in 77. I was an EOP transfer student from Santa Ana College and was a double major. I got my uh, degrees in psychology and social ecology in 1980. Um, I think the first thing I ever did was work with you, Dan, on um, effects of air traffic control on kids under the flight path in Los Angeles. Uh -huh. um, and then uh, did work with uh, Peter Scharf and John Flowers, published a couple things with them before I left. Um, I was supposed to start a PhD program in clinical psych at Irvine, and that was uh, just when Prop 13 kicked in, and there were about 10 of us, and they came to us in like May and said, oh, by the way, program's not going to happen, um, and they farmed us out to friends. I ended up going to uh, Lubbock, Texas, and uh, found myself in September in, in Lubbock at Texas Tech in the clinical psych program. Spent a year there doing med surge patients and other things and, and was encouraged to get a become an MD psychiatrist if I was going to do that. So I went to UC San Francisco School of Medicine, loved, loved the field, hated the doctors, hated the whole hierarchy of it. So eventually I got my master's from San Francisco State, uh, opened a couple of businesses. And in the early 90s, I went to the University of Washington and got uh, PhDs in uh, business and public affairs. And for the last uh, 30 odd years, I've been at Kane University, uh, which is a public university in the state of New Jersey um, in the College of Business and Public Management. I'm the chair of the uh, public administration department. And uh, this year I'm the chair of the university Senate. So I've, I've spent the last 30 years out here in New Jersey and Connecticut. Um, this is my house, a uh, mid-century modern house in New Canaan, wow. um, just outside of Greenwich, um, which is where most of you probably have heard of, of uh, Greenwich more than you might have heard of uh, New Canaan. And uh, this is our brand new office building. We've not got to, it opened and a week later they shut the university down for COVID. So mm -hmm. I have an office in there that I got to look at once, but I've never actually got to sit <laughs> in the last year. <laughs> Uh, Craig, where's it located in New Jersey? Uh, Kane is in Union, uh, just okay. outside of Newark, just south of Newark. I see. Yeah. Fantastic. Born yeah. in Patterson. So. Looks okay. like a, a, a Frank, Frank Lloyd Wright kind of house that you're in. My, my, my father-in-law was one of the Harvard Five architects, uh, huh. Landis Gores. So he worked with uh, Johnson hmm. and, and on the glass house and all those things. So uh, this is actually the house he designed and built in 1947. So uh, my wife and I are living in, my wife and I are here, so. Uh, Dan, uh, say hello to uh, uh, Dave Taylor, Daniel Madison. Dan, Dave, great to see you. You'll probably have some of your papers in my boxes stacked <laughs> up in the research office. <laughs> uh, Megan, you wanna, oh, I'm sorry, Ray, do you wanna, didn't mean to cut you off. No, I just want to say say hi to both uh, Dan and Dan. Yeah, we're going to come around to all of you. Uh, Megan's Megan's doing a, doing a very smart. You're doing a very smart thing, staying active and moving around during a Zoom meeting. I, I should do that more myself. But anyway, hi, thank you. Welcome. Um, so I graduated in 2000. Um, I got my master's in forensic psychology. I was a cop for a while. And then I went back to school, got my doctorate in psychology, and I've been licensed since 2015. Fantastic. Where did you get your doctorate, Megan? Alliant. Alliant, at Alliant. In Irvine. In Irvine. So. Yeah. And then when I saw this, I couldn't believe that you're still there and teaching, Dr. Navaco. Had to come in and yeah. say hi. <laughs> well, about uh, four years past retirement at full time. <laughs> it actually cost me money to work. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Well, it's nice to see you. 
it, it's just hard to keep the bones moving as they used to. <laughs> yeah. And for me, I went emeritus uh, some years ago, but I'm, I'm still on like seven or eight dissertation committees and research projects. So it's yeah, writing books and articles. <laughs> I mean, never stops. I'm, I, you know, it, it, it's a, it's a good blend, I think, but uh, I, I admire Ray for hanging in there with all those routines and faculty meetings, curriculum planning, job searches and all of that good stuff. Um, how about Tom, you want to say a few words from uh, back in the what, 80s, I guess it was, right? Yeah, Tom Clay. Uh, see a couple familiar faces. Hey, Marianne <laughs> and Fran. <laughs> uh, I was hoping there'd be a couple of people from the old days. Back in the days, it was the program in social ecology, right? Yeah. I was kind of hoping the thing would succeed so that in later years, you know, I could I could say that I came from the school of social ecology. Well, Dan anyway, was the founding dean, Tom. What's that? Dan was the founding dean of the school. I remember that. Yeah, I, I followed you yeah. guys. It's and uh, before, I, I could just give you a brief bio of where I've been like nobody else was doing that. I got to preface it by saying, Dan and Ray, you guys are looking great. You know, oh, you're still, you're kind. still hanging <laughs> Yeah, I don't. You remember? You, I had kind of longer hair then. For those who knew me, and I now uh, have gone. I've gone. I've gone. Uh, you know, the trendy thing here. You know, in, in 20, 2021. Anyway, so uh, I came from uh, Gil Geis was uh, who I'm so sad has passed with my uh, program or my uh, dissertation mm -hmm. chair. And as Dan mentioned, not all of you were on the call at the beginning, but uh, Dan commented that I. I did their soundboard for the uh, jazz band at the, uh, in, what was the name of the place again, Dan? Um, oh, the back lot. The back lot, yeah. right, exactly. And I, yeah. I, I looked for a couple of cassette tapes. I couldn't find them. I know they'd be very valuable now if I could find them. <laughs> uh, I've got a few, but they're not too valuable, I don't think. Uh, <laughs> Butler Street Blues Band. Yeah. Tony <laughs> Bennett. Right. Yeah. We, we, so, uh, you know, if we have time later, we can relive some of those days. But uh, <clears throat> I, I got my doctorate uh, just a little bit before Marianne died, I guess, 1983, I left there. And uh, I went to work for, the, I did not take an academic career. I worked uh, first for the uh, LA County Municipal Courts as a program analyst, and then eventually wound up as a behavioral sciences consultant for the uh, LA County Health Department. And uh, then also did some evaluation for some nonprofits. I got really burnt out of all of that, uh, a much longer story, and totally changed careers uh, in 1997 and went into work doing consulting and selling and marketing of high tech communications equipment and security systems. Uh, not exactly the training I had in social ecology. But, Was that your uh, own company, Tom? Was that your company? No, I worked for, uh, well, I did some of my own, but I, I basically worked for Motorola uh, uh, in, their, in their, uh, their stuff. But I, but I was happy doing it. I did a lot of volunteer work that, that brought the social ecology you know, background into play. Mm -hmm. And uh, I lived in Santa Monica for many years. Uh, four years ago, I had a little rent control department, but somehow the training I had and the jobs I had never quite allowed me to buy a house in Santa Monica. <laughs> Never quite could pull that off. I had a little rent control department. So four years ago, I moved back to Arizona uh, to where I where my uh, kind of my roots were. Uh, my son, who some of you knew as a 10 year old and uh, Zach, a 10 year old is now in his mid forties and a marriage and family counselor in, in uh, Mesa where I am. So I'm, and I'm retired now and just as happy as can be. Uh, I value all the training and work that I did and the, time, the good times and the social and the academic stuff in social ecology. Um, I just want to, what else I wanted to mention? That I'm uh, 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 doing a lot of volunteer work in the political field in Arizona. And I am, uh, not, to, not to inject uh, too much political stuff into this call, but <clears throat> we turned Arizona blue last year. We now have uh, two Democratic senators and, uh, and Biden won the election. And, uh, I count that as a uh, uh, as valuable as anything else I've been doing. I think that's it for me for now, and it's good. I hope that maybe Fran and Marianne at some point we can connect again. Marianne, just so I don't forget, 
is your your website if i if i type in accidental impacts find will i find your, Google, your company yes. okay thank you yeah uh, dan, dan anderson had his hand up i was i was just celebrating tom's achievements in arizona yeah well you know some of the, the analysts who talked about what happened a lot of it has to, a lot of Latinos living here, and secondly, a lot of people moving here from other states, and that's me. So, so Dan, do you want to say a few words, and then we'll we want to, we'll go around, continue. I welcome the Gill, who I see joined, and uh, yeah, this is fun. It's great hearing about what you're doing. Me? Yeah. Go, Dan. Yeah. Yeah, I'd like to say hi to you first. I don't think we've actually ever met in person, I don't recall. Um, but Ray, um, I I spent a lot of time working in various, well, working for Ray um, on various studies that he was conducting. That uh, was a really wonderful experience. Um, I graduated in 1979. I was a double major, biology and social ecology. Um, and... Um, you know, I responded at one point to some kind of a solicitation for help with research studies and um, ended up doing quite a few with Ray. Um, and it was, like I said, it was amazing. Anyway, my just short story, I, I graduated and I got a PhD in neuroscience from UCSF and did some postdocs. And uh, I've been on the faculty at Stanford now for 31 years um, and I'm now an associate uh, department chair, which I hate, and um, but I'm still doing science, and so I love that. Um, I had kind of a funny little anecdote, Ray, I, I, from the day working for you. Uh, I was doing a study where I was uh, meeting subjects of your study and taking their blood pressure sort of continuously while we read them stressful scenarios, and I recall that you were doing a study on, um, you had a word for it, uh, but you know, when, uh, when obstacles got in the way of your, uh, you know, whatever it was you were trying to do, then that there was some kind of impedance that was imposed on you. And you were trying to basically figure out something about the stress responses, um, you know, and so there would be these scenarios, just sort of everyday scenarios that turned stressful and we'd be monitoring, you know, galvan galvanic skin responses and blood pressure and all of that. And um, one day I met, and I'm just gonna preface this by saying that this story is not gonna turn out the way you think initially, uh, it's very short and boring, but um, I met the most beautiful girl I'd ever seen. This girl walked into the study and she was just like, amazing and I I tricked her into giving me her phone number um, as part of you know you know the questionnaire and then I went home and I thought what would Ray do and I realized that what Ray would do was throw that phone number away because it was kind of a, a violation of the whole you know subject experimenter ethos and so I never called her so anyway that's but that did happen um and uh yeah i see you're a professor of cellular and, and molecular physiology so all all of that blood pressure work and physiology work <laughs> kind yeah of no it was all great preparation honestly it really was Fantastic. Um, and uh, you know i'm really grateful for the opportunities that i had at Irvine. um uh you know, I tell people all the time, you know, I get a lot of questions from people about how do I get started, and, you know, if I want a career in research and I, you know, I always tell them, you know, how I got started and, you know, how you get your foot in the door and, you know, Ray was just an incredibly valuable part of that to me. So thank you, Ray. Um, and it's good to see you. Thank you, Dan. It's wonderful to see you. And uh, let's, let's get in touch on email. I think you, you sent me a letter of probably, uh, you know, 25 some years ago, and I probably have it in a file. You, you responded the last time I wrote to you. It was, we had a nice little conversation. Uh, yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll drop, I'll catch you. Yeah, again. please, please do, all of you. Uh, so Fran Dickman's what, been around. Fran Dickman's here, been here for Yeah, while. Fran, do you want to say a few words, and then we'll go to, uh, I think, Rick and. Uh, sure. I was in the, um, I was in the introductory class uh, in the program in social ecology in the PhD program. 
and got my degree in 1979. Um, I had been um, uh, a sociologist with a master's degree and working in evaluation research. So I did my dissertation on people who did applied research in, the, in San Diego County. And I, I promptly moved to DC where my husband was um, at the NIH. And I worked for the National Institute on Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism uh, as a program analyst and a contract manager. And, um, and I've ended up making five cross country moves. I moved from um, the DC area back to California where I could not find a job for a number of years. So I moved back to the DC area and got a job with um, the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration because I was an alcohol specialist and I worked in highway safety um, for uh, a, a number of years um, with details to a few other federal agencies, um, including NIOSH, the National Institute on Occupational Safety and Health, because the most serious problem um, with respect to workers on the roads doing road work is drunk driving. And they needed somebody who knew something about drunk driving. So I spent uh, about a year with NIOSH in Morgantown, West Virginia. Mm. And because I ran into the glass ceiling, which is a really common problem when you're a social scientist in a non-research agency, I decided to go to law school because I had written the regulations for, you know, the stop arm on school buses that says stop, pops out. I, I wrote those regulations with our legal department. So I decided to go to law school and I, um, I went to the university, West Virginia University, got a law degree and decided that this was absolutely the worst occupation I could possibly pursue. So I didn't, um, I still see myself as a sociologist and doing applied research and I've had a, a very, very bumpy career since law school because I'm not fixed anywhere. Um, again, I've made many moves across country. So here I am in Phoenix, Arizona, where we've been for 19 years. And I'm, uh, I'm on the board of the Arizona ACLU and um, the local Chamber Music Society for a while, I ran a rehab program for women felons. Of course, I knew nothing about criminology, um, but thanks to my very broad exposure to social ecology, I learned fast. Um, and um, I, I, my husband and I are here, have been here for 19 years. He's soon retiring from the uh, Department of Pathology at the Children's Hospital in Phoenix. And we have four parrots. Um, one more thing. Um, a few yeah, years that, ago- That was, was you with the background noise. <laughs> yes. A few years ago, I was asked to do a study of my college classmates in preparation for our 50th college reunion. So going back to my survey roots, I did a survey of the class of 69 at Vassar, which was the last women's class at Vassar and um, found some very interesting things about who we were and who we still are. And I'm also very happy to say that um, we, we think Arizona is, is certainly purple and maybe turning blue. So hi, Tom, we'll connect. Uh, um, just a bit, what are you doing with the Chamber Music Society? I'm on the board. Yes, but what the, are you doing? Uh, what do I do? You have an annual festival? We have an annual, well, this year, of course, practically nothing has happened. We, we have a, a few concerts that will be outdoors. We don't dare have anything inside. Um, and we, will, uh, we have a, um, a festival every year, primarily with um, players from the uh, Lincoln Center Chamber Music um, crowd. Um, and I, this year, as a result of COVID, we're having one or two um, concerts rather than the, a, an entire week of concerts. Um, everything's been very, very, very restricted in Arizona because our rates, our COVID rates are very, very high. 
and um, we we don't have much in the way of um, preventive good preventive behaviors. So we keep getting sick. So thanks, thanks, friend. Yeah, Olivia, I have to check out. So wonderful to see you. Uh, and, Dave Miller's been on for a while, and Dave, I'm real keen to hear what you've been doing. And I want to welcome Judy and Sherry, who just joined. We're, we're going yeah. to come around to you and ask you to say a few words about what you're doing these days. Okay, Dave. I, I, it's, I feel it's very, really boring because I came out to Niagara University in 1999 and I've never left. So I've been here the fastest 22 years of my life. I can't believe it. So I've been in the criminology and criminal justice department here and I'm the chair uh, right now. I, I was, it, I'm doing the easy math here because there's a number of people on the call you know, who were talking about 1979. I know I graduated in, 19, uh, in, in 99 and 2019 was a couple of years ago. So, you know, we're talking about well over 40 years for you two gentlemen uh, with your engagement and involvement with, with UCI. And I would echo what Olivia has been posting in the chat, you know, thank you for, for all the guidance. And I, uh, I got a great story. So when I started at Irvine uh, and Daniel, I probably should have I should, probably should have somewhere along the way shuttled over to working with Professor Novako on his research as opposed to being his teaching assistant. Uh, but it, you know, when I started in 1992, um, I, I think I was, I got the sense that a lot of people didn't want to work with Ray because he was very tough, um, which led me to say that I absolutely want to work with him. And I experienced this firsthand and I've been telling this story. I actually had forgotten about this story until I got on this call. Uh, and, and of course, it's one of those that, you know, I know it happened, but I've probably made it much bigger over the years. But one year I wrote, and I've never been one to fill out a Christmas card just to put my name but, uh, on it. But I remember I wrote a nice Christmas card to, uh, to Professor Novako, put it in his mailbox, came back in January, and it was back in my mailbox. I thought, well, maybe he didn't get it or I put it in the wrong mailbox. But no, he had, he had taken a red pen and he edited my Christmas card. <laughs> and then to me, <laughs> and, uh, and that was that was that was delightful. Uh, yeah, I, think so, right. I, I think you're making that. <laughs> well, you're pretty sure that happened. At least the, it was some part of it. But um, you were doing your you were doing your work in criminology, law, and society, and you took on that fantastic project with homelessness. And what you living up in Skid Row for about six months? I was, and I was actually recently asked. I, I was recently asked to to give a talk. Uh, on extreme poverty and talk about my experiences on Skid Row. And, you know, that was more than 20 years ago. And so I had to sort of reacquaint myself with Skid Row. So I found some videos, you know, just dash cam videos of people who were driving through Skid Row a couple of Christmases ago. And I thought to myself, I know this area so well. How do I not know where this guy is, you know, driving? This can't be Skid Row. And I knew there hadn't been a huge investment in that area. And just come to find out that, you know, when I was there, it might have been a 10, 12 block area. And, you know, these days, I think it's what, upwards of 30, 40 blocks. So, you know, that's, that's and, and to see the numbers of homelessness coming out of Los Angeles has just been so, you know, so upsetting. Um, but, yes. yeah, so, so here in Niagara, I mean, I've, I've done a whole, I've had great opportunities. You know, I created an institute for civic engagement. I started an emergency preparedness program that's been running for 15 years. We train all residents in Niagara County and Erie County and the city of Buffalo. Um, I, it, it's just been a, it's, it's been great, but I really do owe it all, you know, I should all, but I, I owe a heck of a lot of it to the faculty at, the, at, at, at Irvine. And I, I know I don't express it enough and I haven't expressed it enough over the years. So at least in this small way, you know, I want to thank you and, I was delighted. It's so nice to see. I don't know. I don't know. I think I don't think most of the people here were around my time. I know Rick Harvey. I, I, I've met Rick before. Um, but it's nice to meet all of you. And it's wonderful to hear these stories. So thank you very much. And I think for Ray and my part, we are just incredibly proud of all the accomplishments you've all done over the years since leaving UCI. So we're, uh, we're thrilled that you can be here and be part of this conversation. Uh, Going to go to Rick and Tracy and uh, Gil, Ricardo, Judy, and Sherry. So let we'll and then we'll just open it up more, you know, crosstalk. So hi, Sherry. Rick, why don't you chime in? Uh, and, and I should say, Rick is a professor at uh, San Francisco State University, and uh, 
tell us more. <laughs> well, first, uh, hi to David. Um, hi to Sherry. I, I've seen you. Uh, it's amazing that we're having this chance to get together. And it's really great. I also wanted to echo that I'm, I'm as well a Jersey boy up in Patterson. I know Ray knows that, but that's some time ago. And uh, so thanks, thanks, Craig, for bringing the New Jersey uh, connection in. And I also wanted to say that um, a lot of us that get together in these venues can share not only what we've been doing from the past, but also the present. So for example, um, um, I was recently in communication with Dan uh, via email about uh, um, some of the work that we've been doing. And I held up a book and I, I said, I wrote this. And then Dan says, oh, well, I just published my book, Social Ecology in the Digital Age. It's like, that's an amazing document. And then I was also reminded that some of the work that uh, Ray has been doing um, is also present. Like there's a scale called the Dimensions of Anger Reactions, the DAR5, it's a five item anger reaction scale which is built on the Novato Anger Scale. Uh, uh, and I thought that would be perfect for a new study that we're planning um, on immigrant health. And uh, way back when reading the, you know, transportation and stress and community psychology paper that Dan and Ray wrote together uh, with Jeannie, by the way, um, it reminds me of all of the connections that we have over the years to weave together all of those influences that started off with our introductions in social ecology to the intellectual and the, uh, as well as the, the, the compassion side of all of the educators there. Uh, just an incredible wealth of knowledge. So, so thank you um, for all the great work. Um, as Dan you. mentioned, I'm, I'm currently faculty at San Francisco State. I'm a professor in holistic health studies, which is a mind-body approach, but we weave together a lot of all the principles of, of social ecological work. And um, I also wanted to remind us that, that there are folks that are connected. Uh, John Whiteley with Transdisciplinary uh, Science was part of a team that I work on with Dan. Um, uh, Sal Matty uh, was also involved in some of the earliest clinical work before UC at Irvine currently has a clinical project. Sal was uh, brought on to start that. He died recently a few months ago. Um, sadly, and didn't get a chance to um, see all the fruits of the clinical work um, that are forthcoming. But, so thank you, Ray, for, for taking that forward. And also thanks to both of you for continuing to stay connected with UC Irvine. It's just amazing that, you know, it's, it, it's a privilege to be in a position where you can continue working well into retirement, whatever that means. I'm far from retirement, I'm mid-career, but um, only about 15 years since since graduation. So I have, a, I have a, a, a long road to hoe, but I look forward to uh, following your footsteps. And, and thanks again for all your great work. You know, one of Dan's um, uh, favorite papers when we were articles when we were uh, doing uh, this seminar in social ecology for graduate students uh, was a paper by Fiery called Sentiment and Symbolism. And you know, it's easy to cast stones at uh, nostalgia these days as if people are just referring to the past and wanting things to be as they were in the past. But the great value of remembering things in the past is to see uh, how you were shaped and how things have developed and how many good things can evolve from those wonderful experiences. And things do change and uh, our lives do become better. Um, Rick from Patterson and, and uh, Craig's mentioning of New Jersey, you know, uh, where I grew up in Patterson, New Jersey wasn't, <laughs> wasn't a place a person should want to hang around for a very long period of time, you know, and life's been, life's been good to a lot of us, all of us, uh, the fact that we're still moving around is, uh, when people ask me, how are you doing, it's great, I'm still moving, uh, <laughs> and, and, and there are wonderful things in the past that we treasure, and it, it, it it's, it's an inspiration for human possibilities and how things can be. And it, it makes for optimism rather than I think depression. Yeah, well said. And, and thank you, Rick, for joining and uh, your contributions. And I, it was a pleasure for me to be able to order your book and have a copy with right here actually on techno stress. So congrats on that. Mm. Uh, Tracy. Hi, everybody. Hi. Um, I, I'll tell you a little bit about my history and then I want to tell a quick story, but I'll make it relatively quick. I was an undergraduate in social ecology. I graduated in 1991 
And um, I really feel like I gained so much from the social ecology school um, because I really got the research bug. Um, as part of my work there, I actually did research with Allison Clark Stewart, Wendy Goldberg, mm -hmm. Ellen Greenberger. We worked on the NICHD study of early child care. And that's that a very, funny. very good group. Yeah, that, yeah. Yeah, that, yeah, that, yeah, that was a wonderful period. Yeah. Yeah. It was such an incredible time um, for me to, to learn about research and, and uh, I just enjoyed it so much that I, I decided this is what I wanted to do. In fact, I remember telling Allison, could I be used someday? And, um, and Allison, of course, with the memory that she had, you know, many, many years later, reminded me that I walked into her office to say these things to her. So um, I'm happy that I was able to do that. Um, but I, I ended up going to graduate school, got my master's and PhD at Penn State University, and then um, got my academic career started at Arizona State University. So I'm a fellow uh, Tempe, Arizona. Uh, I, I also mm -hmm. wrote postcards and feel responsible for turning Arizona blue. So um, we, um, so I've been at ASU for the last 20 plus years, a full professor here in the School of Social and Family Dynamics, which is very similar to social ecology and its interdisciplinary approach. Yeah. Um, so I really feel that I have a lot to thank from the social ecology department, but now I wanted to just tell a quick little story, um, which is one of the reasons why I wanted to jump on today because it is a Dr. Navaco story, which is, um, uh, a legend actually in my home. So I did want to let you know you are a legend. Um, in my home, even though I never worked with you and I, I was invited to TA for you, but I chose not to, and I'll tell you why in a moment. <laughs> um, I was uh, one of, I don't know, hundreds in a very large lecture that you taught. I'm not even sure what the topic was, but I know that we walked in and similar to Olivia's story of you you know, explaining to everybody you have to work hard in this class, but I also recall that you would call on people. Um, you must have had the roster in front of you and if, you know, people would be called on regularly to answer questions, which scared me quite a bit, but really forced me to do the work. I remember one uh, cross-cultural study. This is a memory again. This is my legend that I tell people. Uh, there was a cross-cultural study that we had to read, and I'm sure you'll remember it better than I will of what you assigned to us, but it was something that, you know, some cross-cultural study between the U.S. and, say, Macedonia or something, and um, you called on someone and had them explain what the findings of the study were. At the end of the person's explanation, they did a very good job. Of course, I was so glad you didn't call on me. And, um, and you asked, so uh, did you check out where Macedonia was on the map? And the person was like, uh, no. And you're, how could you read this entire article and not see where Macedonia was? This is my legend story that I tell my teens now of why if you're good, if you read an entire article and you don't know where this whole thing is and you read the whole thing, um, you don't belong in this class. So that was what I recall from that. It scared me silly. Um, and I worked so hard in that class. I worked so hard from that day forward in every single class because I learned that this is what curiosity is about. And this is what, you know, real learning is about because you taught me that. So um, thank, I want to thank, thank you. Thank you, Tracy. It might've been, um, I don't remember uh, an article about Macedonia, but I'm, I'm thinking about what the possibilities might have been. It might have been the uh, article on boiling water in a Peruvian town. Very well could have been. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Tracy. Thank uh, you. It was a public. It was a public health article. <laughs> yeah, and I, and I, you know, we're, the university you're at, Arizona State, has been uh, a leader in mm -hmm. transdisciplinary education, community engagement, and all of that under. Michael Crow, so it's it's, it's an interesting, mm -hmm. exciting place to be. That's right. Well, Very resonant one in innovation, they say. So yeah. yes. Resonant with you. psychology. Tracy, you look very hardy. So uh, uh, send me a send me a message so I could uh, follow up and see what you're doing. I would love to. Thank you. Thank you. I want to welcome Toby, Toby Warden, who joined, and uh, we'll come around Toby and ask you to say a few words. Toby's a PhD alumna from our school. Uh, Gilbert Gilson Guerra. You want to say hi? 
Hi, I'm, uh, I did my undergraduate in 1983 uh, and then went on to do an architectural degree uh, with a, uh, at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee uh, with Sherry Aronson, who was an alum from uh, Irvine in uh, social ecology. Um, so kind of fast forward, I'm uh, actually a Jesuit priest as well. I uh, was ordained in 2002 and now teach and am an associate professor in the School of Architecture at the University of Detroit Mercy. So I've been out in Detroit now for uh, 15 years, uh, which has been wonderful because Detroit's been going through massive kinds of changes in, in a lot of different realms. Mm -hmm. I think my one um, uh, um, environmental psych story was uh, one of the uh, the places that Dan kind of introduced me to early on was Pruitt Igo, which was a famous housing project that they had to blow oh, up yes. Uh, yes, back in the seventies. <clears throat> and uh, I found myself actually working with the group of um, of uh, tenants who were was that St. From... Louis? Work? Yes, in St. Louis. Louis. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Sir. And so when I was doing philosophy studies as a Jesuit, I was working with a group of uh, tenants in a housing project in St. Louis and became a thorn in the side of the housing authority there. And so while we were there at one meeting, all of a sudden there's all these pictures of Pruitt Igo before the explosion. And it was really just kind of a, a feeling of like coming, coming full circle, having studied it, having looked at it. And then, uh, um, yeah. yeah, so it was, just, it was just a wonderful kind of reminiscing of my time back in Irvine in the study of environmental psychology, which oddly enough is what I'm teaching now uh, to the students, the architecture students here in Detroit. So I've enjoyed my whole time at Irvine and uh, find that it still keeps coming back in different ways. Yeah. Well, what an impressive life trajectory and all the good things you've been doing. And you know, again, thank you for choosing to spend some of your time today with us. And oh, that's great. Thank you. Uh, uh, Gilbert, may I ask you, what drew you to the Jesuits? Um, you know, actually my thesis in architecture was on homelessness, again, with Sherry Aronson. And I think that kind of opened me up to um, just looking at larger world issues. So when I went into that, I never thought I'd go back to architecture, which I had worked in Los Angeles mm -hmm. for a couple of years. Um, and I just found myself drawn to it. Um, and the Jesuits were, uh, always interested in the academic world, and I found. Oh, of course, you know the Counter Reformation. The yeah, Reformation was. They led it in Rome, and yeah, <laughs> Ignatius Loyola, you know, this uh, major major figure during that period. Yeah, yeah, and and again, I think that cross disciplinary thinking uh, that occurred, uh, you know, with the Jesuits is something I think also that emerges from what mm. happens at Irvine. Yeah. So uh, I'm going to go to Sherry McMahon, who is the provost at San Bernardino, Cal State University San Bernardino, and we've continued to stay in touch, and she did a really interesting dissertation on the effects of living near power lines on cancer rates. So uh, it's, it's a really great to have you join our conversation. Congrats on all you've been doing. Oh, thanks so much, Dan, and great to see you. You both look tremendous. I feel like the only one that's getting older here is me. <laughs> and the pandemic has certainly no. just wiped me out no. in terms of logistics. <laughs> Sherry, I, I feel like I've aged five years in the last year and a half. Just yeah, been, it's been tough, hasn't it? Yeah, it's, it's been rough. The, the, the degree to which this crisis has cut into normal routines uh, it, it's had an enormous effect. You know, you know absolutely. <clears throat> so, um, and I think you said it all, Dan, I'm, I'm provost and it's uh, been an exhausting year. I feel like this has been 10 years of my life <laughs> in this one but, year. But Sherry, both, please, yes, please, tell, please tell the rest about your, your history after, after you, you went through and how, after your PhD and how things- Sure, right. well, I'm a so you have a, socially- you have a wonderful career. Oh, twice graduate. So 84 with the bachelor's and 92 mm. with the doctorate. Um, and I worked under, John Erickson was my dissertation, mm. um, the main advisor, but Dan and Dave Dooley also stood on the committee. Again, looking at electromagnetic fields and I uh, looked at depressive symptomatology, but also related to other health effects as yeah. well. And I did a lot of work through that. I went to, um, Cal State Fullerton as a faculty member and spent most of my career there. 
and navigated just about every academic affairs position <laughs> in terms of chair, dean, uh, AVP. Yes, yes, yes. yes. So, all this. So, yeah. A much bigger story than you're, you're, you're conveying, but. No, no, it's all right. It's all good, but it's all thanks to yeah. my background in social ecology and the wonderful mentorship from both of you. And you both are household names. So let me get to the punch right here. Dan, of course, you know, knows my family and has probably watched my kids grow or we touch face every so often. And he's sitting on our advanced board advisory group. So Dan, thanks so much for your works there. And um, yeah, I really appreciate it. And Ray, just so you know, my daughter started college last year, just locally, but I introduced her to the Stanford prison experiment <laughs> on uh, Amazon Prime, and it was a Zimbardo prison study, right? And I learned that. Yeah, there's a that bunch of baloney. <laughs> but that's okay. <laughs> no, hopefully remembering that I said it was a bunch of baloney. <laughs> <laughs> yes, well, I introduced her to some concepts, and I'll never forget you for learning all about some of the most <laughs> <laughs> significant things in my life so and I, and I know you took and I think you TA'd environmental psychology when I we did were teaching it in the basement of the computer science building way back when <laughs> and 194 w, 194w when we used to have uh, for those of you from social ecology who keep track of um, uh, I see some of our administrators are on uh, I used to teach 194w with 360 students and Sherry was one of uh, six TAs in the class Yes. And those, and those students had two projects to do and difficult exams, exams in which the essay question was two pages long. <laughs> and they had to do two projects, not one, two papers. That was all done with six TAs. Excuse me for being cranky, but... <laughs> <laughs> you know, you, you earned your stripes. First gets taught with 150 students and, you know, 20 TAs now. Yeah. And they still can't read and write. It's unbelievable. <laughs> Great to Thanks see you. Thank you. Thank you, Sherry. Uh, Ricardo and Toby. <laughs> Ricardo, right, Dan. Yeah. You want to say a few words? I think you're muted, Ricardo. Uh, there you go. Hey, Ricardo Menez. You guys hear me now? There you are. Hi, Mr. Novato. How you doing? So I'm at a coffee shop, so if it's loud or you hear a croissant being called down, it's because I'm at a coffee shop outside in the lobby. But uh, but it's really quite a journey since I graduated from UC Irvine back in 2014. It was uh, very rewarding because um, I never expected to have Barack Obama be part of the ceremony. So that was very uh, very nice for my mom to see that uh, my, where I was being geared towards something beyond us and for my daughter to see that as well. And um, so that was a nice class to be in. My daughter got a part to see that, which is very... Uh, um, Ricardo, we've lost the audio here. Yeah. All right. Maybe he'll, maybe he'll come back in, but- uh, Instable internet connection there. Yeah. To Toby, you want to go ahead and say a few words? Sure. Wow, oh, Ricardo's back, should we? Oh, Ricardo, did you want to finish? We lost you for a, few, a minute or so. You're on mute. You're on mute, yeah. There you go, sorry. Sorry, I'm at a coffee shop, so mm -hmm. I don't know how good the internet is. Um, but again, um, my- uh, the most rewarding class for me by far was being part of Dr. Novako's class. Uh, it was very nerve wracking and um, being, you know, the first immigrant, the first immigrant, uh, being part of an immigrant class, uh, uh, was hard, I wanted to prove myself to him and he was not the guy who was easily impressed. So it was kind of like, how to be like on my top notch, you know what I mean? Just trying to impress him and try to get like five minutes of his time to just, just have a conversation with him. And um, it was quite impossible to impress him. So. Uh, when I got invited to the seminar class, I really put my my buckle down, and he had a book to, that we had to read. He let us know ahead of time, so it was during spring break. I decided to take that spring break uh, off and just read that material during that week. So um, uh, I was kind of disappointed that we only went through it for like a week, and then he was like, "Okay, that's it." When it took me like 40 hours to read the whole book, and he went through it within a week. I was like, "Wow, all of that," and then you know, my vacation. And then um, 
So it was great. Um, and then um, he was able to write a paper for Mr. Novako, which turned to be a small book in my behalf. I was able to find the original paper and um, I turned to a small book called The Whirlpool Effect Theory and it's self-published through Amazon. So um, anybody could get it. It's just very basic stuff um, uh, regarding the theory and other uh, correlations that I found within the theory and, and on the outside. And then um, uh, I also write music. I know Mr. Novako said something about me playing uh, uh, guitar. So I released a, a CD with like 20 songs. And then my wife, we had a child and I wrote a kid's book and she wants you to publish it, but I haven't done, I haven't done that. But um, she's like, you should really pursue, you're really creative, why don't you write for children? And uh, it's kind of, uh, it's, it's, it's intriguing, but um, it's it's just, you know, something that, um, that I had to have find an illustrator first before you could, you know, it's not just the writing, so. What's the story, I, Ricardo, what's the storyline on the children's book? Uh, it's about, it's, it's, it's kind of like, um, it's teaching the alphabet, uh, and then learning, kind of like embracing other um, uh, different cultures. So like one of the, the last joke is just like how to say ha ha ha, but like in different languages, like in Arabic could be ha 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 ha, in French it would be ha 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 ha, and in English it would be ha 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 ha. So just like embracing like a multi, that I'm, I'm more like embracing multi ethnicity and multi diversity. So it's kind of just, you know, an introduction to different cultures. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but again, I had little success. I had more attempts at success than and failures than actual success. Um, I got into uh, a master's program at Concordia University to do, um, to do um, men not mentorship, but counseling. But because uh, of the funding, I, I couldn't afford it. So I had to um, postpone it. And but I still would keep, keep in touch with the director. And he said, whenever I'm, uh, Whenever my finances get sorted out, I'll be able to attend and hopefully become get a master's in counseling. It's uh, so that's that's just pretty much it. But, well, I'm glad you were able to tune back in and and uh, add some of those additional comments. Mm -hmm. um, Good wishes, uh, Ricardo. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Lago. Toby, you want to uh, say a few words too? Sure. Great. How fun to see all social ecologists. Uh, I'll give my background real quick. I actually went back to school in my mid thirties after uh, a range of different life experiences and career experiences, a lot of travel and actually a lot of community work that I did at the frontline level in Boston. And um, I had to go back and start my undergraduate, degree, not finish up my undergraduate degree. So I was finishing up my undergraduate degree and in history, medieval history. And I had to take a course on earth system science uh, at, at Irvine. And of course, that has one of the best uh, climate science programs in the country and the world. So I took that class. It was fascinating, got interested in that. And then I was at the running track running one day and met John Whiteley, uh, Professor Whiteley. And he told him a little bit about my background and my past work. And he just said to me, you belong in social ecology. I'm going to introduce you to Dan Stokels. Mm. So um, so I actually enrolled in SE 200, Dan's foundational class, uh, finishing up my undergraduate um, year, and everything made sense in that class. It was like the world as I knew it made sense in that <clears throat> SE 200. I, you know, I still have the syllabus; it's in a box in the corner over there, but I still have it. Um, wait, 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 hold on, hold on, Toby. Yeah. You did SE 200 as an undergraduate? I finished the in the last. Yes, I did. Yeah. Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah. Yeah, but I was in, I mean, I was an older student and I had done all sorts of other stuff anyways, but just that class just made sense. All of the students were from different disciplines and you really were, it's just a melting pot of, of intellectual ideas and problem solving. It was incredible. So, um, and then I, you know, finished up with my doctorate, um, did my dissertation on climate change in cities and, um, and then headed east after a couple of other small stints in um, Colorado and Oregon and was able to get a job at the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering and Medicine in Washington, DC, where Ralph Cicerone was the president at the time. Um, and our organization uh, does groundbreaking reports on all sorts of topics that impact our lives. Um, everything, there's a national park system exists because of the National Academies. There's no smoking on airplanes because of the National Academies. Like all, we, we bring in these top experts to do multidisciplinary work. So everything I learned from Dan 
just happens on a daily basis um, here in Washington, D.C. I'm so grateful for it. All of these issues we're seeing, the pandemic, climate change, racial inequities, I, I go straight back to social ecology all the time. And for those of you who haven't seen this, this work, um, Dan actually served as a volunteer on an academy's uh, report that came out a few years ago on team science. It's right here. I, I have it right by my desk all the time. And it has really good um, guidelines for doing transdisciplinary work. So for those of you working in um, administration and universities, I'm sure you're all building multidisciplinary, transdisciplinary centers yourselves. I highly recommend it, but I'll just conclude again by saying so grateful. And one last thing, I do follow Dan on Instagram with his photos, which are amazing. So one of them I actually have on my phone, this one right here, I blew it up because it just, wow. was, I, just I just got, I felt so much, I, I got so much power from it, right? And Dan, when I look at this phone, I immediately think of the fish scales. Uh-huh, uh-huh. You, you know, the Tom fish Campbell. scales, what did you say? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so the layers of you know overlap between disciplines. So uh, thank you. Exciting to hear what people are doing. Phenomenal, phenomenal. What a what a journey. And uh, I also got to work uh, sort of for Toby on a uh, report that she commissioned on food security in the 21st century. So she, Toby's been ex very involved in a lot of the the research that comes out through these different panels. So thank you very much for joining, and it's great to see you again. So I think we've, has anybody not spoken? I know we lost a couple of people, unfortunately, but um, you know, we're at about 12, 18 and, and you know, Ray and I are very sensitive to the limits of Zoom meetings, you know? <laughs> so it's not as if we have to hang out till one, which is yeah. the time we have, but, but any, any additional points you wanna raise or conversation you wanna jump into, we're here. So we'll stay as long as you guys want to, but we, we know it's a Saturday and uh, we've been going for about an hour and 20 minutes, so. I'll just, I, I could say a couple of things for those yeah. who are still on, on board about what's happened in the school, um, other achievements and developments that you, you might not be aware of. Um, in addition to the clinical psych program that I said a little bit about, uh, some of you would know because uh, uh, Folks like Dave and others were our criminology law society people. We have this master's program in uh, in the uh, CLS uh, uh, department. We're now uh, now departments. Um, so this is a master's in advanced study in criminology, and it's the number one program in the country. It's always been up there at the very very top, as has the whole criminology law and society uh, program. That uh, Arnie Binder and Gil Geis. And then later, Henry Pontel and, and others, uh, and John Dombrek, of course, um, took on took on board and helped shape and build. So that's been very successful. But that's an online course. And in psychology, we uh, caught on a bit uh, let, later and developed two um, uh, new programs. The online program is the Master's in Legal and Forensic Psychology that um, uh, Professor Beth Kaufman is so expertly uh, directs and shaped um, and um, go on for uh, quite a bit of time in conjunction with the, uh, the MLFP program because it's connected with the Center for Psychology and Law, which uh, also Beth Kaufman directs. And it, the uh, resources that are uh, uh, connected to those programs also are going to feed into our clinical psych program. Um, in addition, in psychology, we have this uh, post-bac, post-baccalaureate program that Professor Joanne Zinger um, strongly uh, 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 shaped and developed. When this post-bac program was first proposed, I kind of poo-pooed it. I didn't think of, this was such a, a brilliant idea, but it's turned out to be absolutely sensational. It brings uh, some resources into the department, but our, the students that have come through it so people completing their undergraduate work and being a bit unsure as to what direction they want to go will uh, become part of this post back program. The selection on that is actually, um, uh, we've got a good selectivity rate. People get linked up with particular professors as post back scholars. It's not online. Of course it's online during COVID, but normally it's not. And then you get linked to our research labs and these students have gone on to just uh, wonderful graduate programs uh, since then. Several students who work with me have gone on to top-notch programs. So uh, these are, you know, really, uh, you know, 
wonderful, wonderful developments that um, I don't think any of you would have been um, uh, familiar with, and certainly not during the years that you were here. Yeah, I just want to add that um, when I was mm -hmm. at Irvine, I got um, a, a, chan a chancellor's um, research fund um, scholarship to underwrite my dissertation research. And um, as a consequence of that, I've turned around and I've created a little a fellowship for students at Irvine who are writing their dissertations to fund their dissertation research. So if you guys um, who are still hanging around Irvine know anybody who needs that money, um, it's, it's managed by the, um, the criminology department. Thank you. Uh, well, thank Dale, you so much for, um, Dale uh, Glazer just came on board here. Yeah. You want to say hi, Dale, and just a little bit about what you're doing, where you where you been since social ecology? Yeah, hi everybody, I hope you're well. My name is Neil Glazer. I'm a graduate from 1979 during the Jurassic era. So a <laughs> long, long time ago. Um, I remember when I became a major, I was pre-med for two and a half weeks and then I had to take dreaded organic chem and I thought I should ship. And there was a new, a fairly new program called social ecology. And I remember going home with mom and dad and, there's, and they had no idea what social ecology was. They were a little befuddled. And it just was a, a fantastic, fantastic program. I had Dr. Stokel's IDU for one class, and Dr. Nabaco, I had you for quite a few community psychology. I had all your community psych classes back in the 70s. And um, uh, basically, what I do now is I uh, really quickly I just did my master's afterwards in counseling psychology, and I worked as a vocational rehab counselor in Long Beach, working with those who had industrial injuries and helping them get back to work. I ended up managing our firm. And then I, afterwards, I went and did my PhD in industrial organizational psychology, and I did IO psych for a while at Sharp Healthcare in San Diego. And I always loved statistics. I had Bob Newcomb for stats back in 78, and just loved stats. And I kind of came, I, I became an applied methodologist statistician and started teaching at, uh, for time at San Diego State, USD and UCSD, where I teach stats, testing and measurement and research methods. And as well, I started my own consulting practice about 16 years ago, where I basically do um, applied statistics, psychometric testing, et cetera. So that, that, that's my spiel, and it's great seeing all of you. No, thanks for joining today. Appreciate it. Thank you, Dale. And I do have a question. Yeah. Office hours type question. So, <laughs> I mean, I feel like social ecology was really ahead of the game with problem-based research, the transdisciplinary approach, bringing everything together. Here in DC, that's finally front and center, yeah. right? So we're just hearing it more, more and more. First, it was multidisciplinary, then interdisciplinary. Now, uh, on an NSF proposal, my program officer said we're looking at transdisciplinary. We're looking at, uh, at also co-production of knowledge. You know, other types of things. Um, what's next around the corner? Uh, any thoughts on that? I mean, it, 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 it's, such an, it, it's, it's such a great approach to tackle the big issues that we're seeing right now. Um, any thoughts or comments on that? Yeah, and I'm sure Ray will have some thoughts about that too. Uh, one of the things we're doing is, uh, and, I, and I, let's see, I put a link in the chat to this uh, Team Science Acceleration Lab project that we have at UCI. And one of the things we've tried to do is take the sort of inter and transdisciplinary approach that we've cultivated through the program and then the School of Social Ecology for many years. And as you mentioned, it's being picked up in a lot of different fields. And there's a tremendous in interest in the ways in which uh, these kinds of goals or aspirations can be achieved. So there's a growing literature on the science of team science, on promoting convergence science, um, co-production of knowledge with community partners. There's, there's a kind of expanding interest in some of those ideas we started with. So, you know, one of the things we've tried to do at UCI, and I know Rick Harvey was involved in some of our studies of transdisciplinary teams and research centers at UCI, we've continued that work to try to build out that field. So we're, we're kind of studying some of the principles that we started with as, as they've been picked up uh, by other organizations and universities. And we do a fair amount of consulting with other groups about those issues, everything from you know the dynamics of team process and you know promoting intellectual synergy and cross-disciplinary teams to promote more innovation. 
So it's a, it's a really interesting field that I've kind of been involved with uh, for the last several years, along with environmental psychology and studies of environmental stress. And some of the things that Ray and I teamed up on back in the 70s and early 80s on you know, studying congestion stress and airport noise uh, with Gary Evans and some other folks. So we're, we're, that's one of the developments. I think another thing where social ecology is being looked to is as the world becomes concerned about stemming climate change. And that's something that, that you pioneered, um, Toby, studying how cities can deal with regulatory strategies to stem climate change. But more and more, these, these large initiatives are looking to marry environmental earth system science, environmental science with issues of social, environmental, biospheric justice, you know, the relationships between different species and an ecosystem to maintain the resilience of that system. And so one of the uh, initiatives at UCI now is called Solutions That Scale, and it's kind of headed up by a team of earth system science folks, but it's drawing pretty heavily on social ecology and informatics and other fields uh, because when you try to roll out these solutions at scale that are going to be effective in reducing emissions and planetary temperatures, it turns out that there are a heck of a lot of social and political blocks to getting those implemented. Everything from, you know, economic concerns about what's cost effective to, you know, what are going to be the negative side effects of trying to seed the atmosphere with aerosols to, you know, uh, cool, the cool the planet. So it when you go from the, the basic science to implementing these evidence-based solutions, you start to knock into all these social ecological considerations, like how do we get that implemented or, or what's gonna be the most cost-effective out of several alternative strategies. So I, I think social ecology is being looked to now, uh, not just in its own right, but how it can be integrated with these other kinds of efforts, whether it's uh, dealing with you know, responses to coronavirus and pandemics or climate change or uh, social movements or what have you. I don't know if that's a, th those are just some thoughts. I, I haven't really, you know, I, I haven't answered your question fully, but I think Ray probably has some other ideas about that in terms of where things are going. That's um, exciting what you just shared. That's really cer exciting. Certainly for the school, I think we, <laughs> we have found over the years that we've had to establish our bona fides in a number of different fields. So Ray mentioned the prominence of our criminology program, the psych and law program, the new clinical psych program, the urban planning work that's being done on water and uh, uh, how climate change affects social, different social groups and geographic groups who are vulnerable, you know, people living in certain regions who are gonna feel the, the first effects of it. So there, there are a lot of those kinds of uh, initiatives going on. But Ray, why don't you mention, you know, your thoughts about that in terms of where the field is going or the school? Uh, Dan, actually, given the amount of time we're going to have, maybe this is an opportunity to ask um, our, our dedicated uh, alumni if they have any suggestions about what the School of Social Ecology uh, should be doing better with regard to connecting with alumni. And, and by the way, we're in the middle of a Dean search now. Yeah. So Dean Nancy Guerra has served for five years. She's now transitioning back to full-time faculty in psychology, psychological science. So there's a, a new Dean search. And, and one of the questions mm -hmm. for that individual is how do we move the school to the next level? You know, what are gonna be these horizon issues that are gonna drive the school and sustain it in the coming years? not just where it's been. And, and I agree that uh, with Toby that a lot of it has been picked up and it's sort of accepted canon now that you should try to be interdisciplinary and apply your research to the world. But uh, you know, the next Dean is gonna have that challenge, how to, how to steer that, these future directions. Uh, Dan, of course, has been on the forefront of that work from the very beginning. But in the remaining time that we have, I really would enjoy and appreciate hearing from some of you about uh, what the school could be doing better with regard to uh, staying connected with uh, alumni. I, I, think, I think the issue of funding of public universities is a very serious problem. Hmm. Um, something like 9% of UCI's funds come from the state of California, which is one of the reasons why I decided that 
rather than giving money to my well-endowed private college, I would give my funds to pu the public schools that helped educate me. And I think all of us who've got um, well-paying jobs should connect financially with social ecology the way I have and um, make a commitment to support a program or um, a research idea or faculty or a department um, within the school because the funds are really, really, really scarce. And- hey, Thanks, um, thanks, Fran. Um, and I understand that sentiment being a graduate of Notre Dame. Um, but you see, I guess my undergraduate experience did a lot to shape me and my views of what education should be and ought to be. Notre Dame incidentally would stayed open for this entire COVID period this year with students in classrooms and students in dormitories. Let me set that aside. But going back to the point, at, at ND, we, it, there, was a unifying, there was a unifying thing. You were at Notre Dame, right? Now, what's happened at UCI in my experience, in particularly as the campus got shaped with the populations that have been part of our student body and where we're located in Orange County, there's, in my view over the years, this, this attachment to unifying symbols on campus has not been what it could be. But in social ecology, we actually have something that you being here, you know, is representative of some attachment to what the school has attempted to do in its pioneering work and what it continues to do. But what can we do better to, 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 to you know, um, you know, nurture uh, that, that sentimental spirit that's there among you? What can we do, what can we do better? Well, I have to say, I mean, one of the things that always surprised me is that I had always assumed that, that our graduates, those who went on particularly into education, would replicate social ecology at other program at other colleges. I always figured by now, 40 years later, there would be some other social ecology programs at other institutions founded by social ecology graduates. And it always surprised me that that sort of never happened. Um, you know, and, and I put something in the chat and, and it just illustrated the fact that I was introduced to one of our board of trustees and they told him, oh, he's got a degree in social ecology. And later the guy was going around telling him I had a degree in, in studying radicals like Bernie Sanders. Um, you know, so not only has the term never caught on, but, but it seems like we never, we never used the initial program as a, a, a seed to plant in other programs. I mean, we all do some of it, but, but kind of may, opening it up as this new important discipline that would be replicated. And that's just, you know, my biggest puzzlement after 41, 42 years now, that there aren't at least a couple more social ecology programs founded by some of our faculty and student alumni. Yeah, I don't know if they, there have been founded by our alums, although a lot of you are, are sort of incorporating social ecology into the work you do, but there are several social ecology institutes and uh, actually curricular programs around the world now. Uh, some very prominent ones in Frankfurt, Vienna, uh, Canberra. And in the book I did in 2018, what I tried to do is provide a conceptualization of social ecology, not as a freestanding discipline, but as more of a, an overarching field with sort of core mm -hmm. principles um, analytic methodological principles that kind of run through our work. And so it's not that everybody agrees with that conception of social ecology, but um, you know, the, I was one of the things that's central to that is how these different domains of environmental influence in human communities, like the natural environment, the built, the socioculture, and the cyber now, how those are kind of interlinked and influence each other. But, uh, you know, I, I think as Toby was saying, there has been a kind of receptiveness more and more to uh, the, the ecological perspective at NSF, at uh, National Academies, at NIH, at uh, CDC. You see it in a lot of their different programs. And uh, it's true, it hasn't eventuated in other kinds of degree programs like we have at uh, Irvine. But the good thing is that we've somehow managed to stay viable or sustainable over 
about 50 years now since the program was established by Arnie Binder in 1970. And that's exciting. We've had to adapt. We've had to, you know, incorporate a school structure with departments and there's a little bit less common ground and synergy across those departments than we were just when we were just a freestanding program. But nonetheless, the, a lot of those ideas do get imparted to the students through our core curriculum like SE 200. Um, and, uh, you know, hopefully we can keep, keep training students to look at phenomena systemically across multiple scales, extended time periods. Um, you know, some of the basic kinds of principles that we tried to, to talk about in the classes that you all took and now you're teaching and, and, and incorporating in your work. Any other thoughts you have about where things are going or should be or things we can do better, as Ray said? What can the academic unit do better to connect with its alumni? Well, I'll say this is really, I mean, this is a great first step. This was, you know, I was sort of like, hmm, this is interesting. I want to see how this how this unfolds, what it's like. Um, but I don't recognize anybody here from my cohort, right? So then I was thinking maybe you could group it by years or do something to see, um, you know, if, uh, if you could get groups of people that could then uh, really reminisce and bond that way, you know, I could still be reaching out to like Ann Toffin or Heather Goldsworthy or some, uh, uh, mm -hmm. some of the other people that were in our group. Um, that could be rewarding too, but this is a great first step. I really like it. Well, I went to homecoming last year, um, which is the first one I've done in 40 years because I'm on the East Coast and they're always during the semester. And my administration always kind of frowned on me taking off to go to a homecoming during the semester. Um, but one of the things that struck me when I was there last year, right before COVID set in, um, was kind of the schism between the people that, that had been able to stay in Southern California and were very active at the institution um, and those who had moved away and basically were like fish out of, oh, first time I've been back, seeing this, the new building, whatever. So I think, I think social ecology in general and, and Irvine in particular have done a real good job in bonding with people who are local, but have really not figured out a way to, to stay mm -hmm. connected mm -hmm. to people who are not living in Southern California and can't be coming to events on campus all the time. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, I, you know, since I went to homecoming, I've been plugged into the alumni association, but since I went to homecoming was when I first started getting the social ecology e-magazine, whatever we're calling that thing. Um, and I also get the one from social science since I have both degrees, but I've never felt like there was anything I could do to stay in touch with what was going on in Connecticut and New Jersey, um, or even with the people around here. Now at University of Washington, I see alumni chapters. I'm invited to alumni events in New York and Connecticut all the time, um, but I've never had that experience um, with Irvine. So um, I, don't know about, I don't know about the people who are local and have that chance to come on campus and, and come to homecomings and do things. But if, <laughs> for me, it, it's, um, it's been sad. I mean, I would have liked to stay more attached to what was going on. I would have liked to stay more attached to the people. I was the only one from my class uh, and, and from the social ecology program when I was there last year. Um, so, you know, I, I echo a little bit about what Toby said about trying to get us together with some of our, our kind of, but I, keep us informed, keep us involved, have events like this. I mean, the emphasis always seemed to be on something on campus. And well, I'm never going to get to go to anything on campus. So, you know, I'm, I, they just don't care about me. I mean, the best thing about Zoom is I've seen more people that I haven't seen in 20 or 30 years because of Zoom, because, you know, it's not dependent on me going to some place that I can't get to. Interesting. Is there anything that, particularly those of you who are in higher education, is there anything we could be doing um, in, uh, the curriculum, particularly in senior year, to help build um, a sentiment bond attachment, reinforce the attachment that can continue on post-graduation. Any thoughts? Well, the, the minute I graduated from Vassar, I began getting fundraising requests. Um, and private universities, private colleges are very, very good at raising money, but the public schools are not. 
Um, what you can do is you can make sure that every one of your graduates at every level, every degree it is on that fundraising schema so that um, people understand how important it is to, to begin funding the program or the, the school. And that, will, that is one way of building that connection. Um, if you're giving money, you've got an investment in, that, in the future of that program that you don't have if you're not giving money. And unfortunately, public schools, public universities have not really figured out how to hit the fundraising um, uh, highway very well at all. But uh, in my experience, I, I'm very connected to Vassar because for 52 years, they've never let me disappear with respect to giving money. Um, and you can give five bucks a year, but that, that maintains a connection that um, you don't have if you're not constantly reminded that you have an investment in the future of your program. So that's what, something I would recommend is that in social ecology and development effort, reach out to every single graduating bachelor's, master's and PhD student, put them on the list. I could interrupt a little bit too. Um, I, I appreciate you know getting the mailings and things like that, but truthfully, uh, my experience has been the personal connections with the people. Um, and so for me, uh, in my example, I was one of pretty few undergraduates that went on to graduate school getting a PhD um, and going into academia. And Allison Clark Stewart, who I worked with, you know, always kept in touch with me. We saw each other at conferences. Um, she would always make a point to say hello. She sent me emails here and there. And at one point, um, I was a young, probably junior faculty, maybe assistant professor. Um, she invited me to come out and chat with a, her graduate class. Um, that experience of coming back once I was a faculty member, um, really connected me with what's happening, you know, it, at UCI. So for me, it was those personal connections with the faculty. And I think for if students are doing field studies or doing uh, research experiences, having faculty, you know, keep track and keep in touch with, um, you know, the, the students that they had connections with really made all the difference to me. I, I hear from Wendy Goldberg every once in a while, you know, so those are those those connections to me were what kept me connected. Yeah, thank you, Tracy. I just, uh, my own sentiment is I think we need to do something much before graduation. And it's, you know, this group that's here today, you're all um, non-representative in a sense, you've gone on to very successful careers and, um, and many of you are also in academia, but uh, I think we need to build things um, uh, in a much better way than we're presently doing with uh, our senior class and graduation. Once graduation gets moved into this Brun Center uh, format where um, there's very little time spent with students and their families. So I, so I greatly miss the graduations we used to have out in Central Park around the social ecology building where faculty were there and you got to see the families. We don't have that anymore. It, it's uh, travel from the parking lot to the Brun Center, get your diploma, uh, scoot out, have some, you know, uh, lemonade and a couple of cookies or whatever sort of. We do both. We have a we have the big ceremony, it's and then the colleges each have their own little ceremony, just for mm -hmm. that reason, so that we can see our graduates. And what do you do, Craig? Say say what you do. Well, we have a, a major ceremony for all of the, the the graduating class, and we only do one. So it's fall, December, June, and August graduates all walk together, yada yada, big thing. It's in the big sports arena in Newark, um, but the colleges host their own graduation events. Um, with a tent outside the buildings and just for, for the college. Um, all the faculty are there. You get to come up, shake hands. We get to meet the families. All the stuff you can't do when you're in a basketball arena, you know, that seats 30,000 people. And, you know, we, we, 
you know, we've, we've did that for just what you're saying is that we, you know, the students wanted to meet us. They wanted their parents to meet us. They wanted, you know, to have that family connection and we couldn't do it in this giant mega site. So we've always done two events. Um, we do the big one and then um, that's in the morning. And then uh, in the afternoon, we come back to campus and each of the colleges have their own little afternoon ceremonies where they get to interact with them. But to, to your point, my wife went to Princeton and if you don't know, Princeton is alumni overload. The, the P rate, I mean, it's just the things they do are just incredible. Yes, of course. As a senior, they introduce them to what's expected of them as a Princeton alumni. <laughs> and so they have a big shtick about your, here's what your responsibility is. One of those things is to interview applicants. So they, uh, Princeton alumni interview every applicant to Princeton University, um, depending on where they live. And so they get to stay connected. You have a voice in whether this kid gets in or not. Not the, not the deciding voice, but you have a voice. Um, you get notices of alumni that live in your area, students that live in your area. So where we are in Fairfield County, she gets a little thing from Princeton saying, here are classics majors that are in Fairfield County, or we just accepted this student and they're from uh, Greenwich. Um, and we get their phone number and their email. So she'll call them and say, hi, I was in the class of 82 and I see your son just got in and anything I can do to help you. And, you know, we, we've gotten to know a lot of families of people who uh, are going to Princeton or went to Princeton over the last 25 years because they keep us in touch. And that was part of your alumni duties is that you're going to be an ambassador for the university for the rest of your life. And we want you interviewing yes. our students. And, and uh, you know, it, it, it's, it's intense. It's a, it's a really intense thing to do, but uh, uh, that's inculcated. Yeah, I like now. those ideas. I, I like those ideas, Greg. I mean, I got the stuff they do. She was class um, treasurer for many years. So I was at a lot of events. <laughs> uh, they, they, have, they have jackets. When your 25th anniversary, your class gets together and picks a logo, if you will, um, a pattern that goes with your class theme and then you get a jacket with that logo and they march every year they have a p-raid not a parade a p-raid and the oldest class goes first the oldest rep of the oldest class and then you know the class of 39 40 41 da, da, da. they're all wearing their own unique colors so you can see what they look like they come from all over the country to do this stuff um you know and you ask them why do you do this and they well, because we have to because we're, we're alumni, we have to do this stuff. And it's just put into their mindset that that's what you're gonna do. It's just incredible <laughs> to see what they do. You know, as a graduate of the uh, University of Chicago College, um, I must get a piece of mail from them every week. And, and sometimes I react against it in the sense that, you know, how much paper and mail are you gonna send me? You know, cause I'll, I'll donate during the year, but I'm not going to donate every week, you know, so it's like, you feel like you're, you're getting submerged with that kind of uh, mailing campaign. I don't know if, if any of you share that view or I'm, I'm an outlier, but it just, it just seems like a heck of a lot of stuff to be putting out into the mail system every week. I don't think I've ever I seen anything mail every week. asking for money. No, I, I, they, they never week. actually ask you for money. They just tell you what they're doing and they yes, ask you for exactly, your time. Exactly. That's what happens at Notre Dame. Yeah, I, well, every I don't month. think every piece of mail I get from Chicago is a. Uh, but by mail you mean email? Email, no, I mean actually surface mail. Surface mail. Yeah, yeah. It kind of, I get some of that at home at, at UCI. Although I haven't checked in the last several weeks at UCI, but I'm sure it's there. But um, so there, there are smart ways to do it where people don't feel like they're just getting pummeled, you know, with these things that they toss because they can't keep up with it. I think like for myself, speak for myself um, when I was attending undergrad, I was working as well and going to school. Yeah. So it was impossible to even go to office hours sometimes, you know, like it wasn't because I was trying to avoid them. It was more like I didn't have time. I was so busy reading material, working and running around. And then before you know it, I graduated and it was another roller coaster. So it was really hard to feel a connection to the school when you're spinning around in circles, just trying to make things work, you know, and um, but when the opportunity did arise and I did make time to uh, meet a faculty like Novako, it really did make a big difference. And I think that's where the connection is, even though like I'm not necessarily so connected to UC Irvine, 
like the first professor that comes to mind is Dr. Novak or uh, Professor Hoffman and uh, the work uh, in investing time in that and in, uh, in, uh, in the students. So I think when a student feels appreciated, they're willing to give back. You know what I mean? They'll do it willingly. You don't have to force them. If you actually make an impact in somebody's life and you reach out to them, they're not going to be hesitant. They're like, wow, these guys really did make a big impact in my life. And uh, whether it was grading an essay or sitting down for five minutes, ordering croissants or whatever. So I think uh, that approach is more beneficial than just, you know, sending out whatever cards. But that's just my two cents. Doug, as, as Director of Development, Doug Colby, do you want to say anything on, on this topic? or? You know, I was I was trying to stay way back in the background and not really in, you know, force myself into this conversation because it's been wonderful hearing all of the experiences and the relationships that you have with each other and and the uh, and uh, our faculty members. We're going to continue to do these programs because I've thought that this was a perfect avenue for um, for us to get all of you together with um, uh, faculty that you remember from back in your time. Um, and I think one thing that this year has taught us, which I think is a very positive uh, thing, is that we're now used to doing this. We're used to getting online and being able to talk. And it's a hell of a lot easier than getting on a plane or getting, I'll, I'll be honest with you, if you live on the west side of LA, your chances of you coming to campus are very, very small. So I think doing more of these things, and we're devising strategies right now to make sure that whatever even live events that we have on campus, that obviously, um, Craig, you're not able to come and attend uh, being where you are. We're gonna make sure that we continue to have an electronic um, sort of virtual component to all of those events. I'm trying to find a way to get very, uh, very creative in how we do that so, that so that those of you on the East Coast or elsewhere in the country can easily come to these programs. Um, and I think you're right, um, as a 50 year young institution, um, we are just coming into our own in terms of keeping outreach. Um, having worked at a number of institutions such as USC, you would think USC is phenomenal at staying in touch with their alumni, but I will guarantee you 60% of their database, they don't even know where their alumni are. And I think it's a problem with every institution. Um, so we've been doing a lot of work just trying to make sure we can find all of our social ecology graduates so we can have year-based type programming and, and have opportunities for people to get together and see people from their own classes. Because I know from the, from the college that I attended, I don't really, I never knew anybody over in the business school. I studied music, so I know all the music people. I would love to be able to, to get online even and, and have these same kinds of experiences. So um, we are definitely listening and taking a lot of notes and I think there's a lot of great stuff coming out of here. I think Jason may have posted something in the chat regarding, um, um, I would love to see us put together some sort of uh, social ecology alumni board. Um, and whether you're interested in, in, in joining that your ideas or not, I think that's something that would help us drive some things that are not what we think you would want, but what actually the 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 alumni from social ecology would like to have. So I just did the alumni dinner thing last week, week before last. It was wonderful. I mean, it was, it was really great. I had seven of the people in the in the little group. It was about this size. Right now, we got about fifty. They reached out to me on LinkedIn and have emailed me and stuff and you know, ask me for advice on their graduate programs and things. So, I mean, it was the first time I've ever done anything as an alumni um, because I could do it on Zoom. Yep. So, and, I think, and, and Craig, I think you're approaching something that's very important is when we do these, we, they need to be a small enough groups where you can actually have good interactions. I think if we spilled out over this screen onto multiple screens, you begin to lose the effect. So um, I think it's good that we might try to put together smaller little little uh, alumni lunches or dinners or what have you. I think that's a great idea. Thank you. And I know I'm going I'm, I'm to stay quiet now. Oh, go ahead, Jeff. Well, it's good that you ch chimed in and uh, have some thoughts about things we could be able to, to do and keep people uh, keeping alumni connected um, by featuring certain topics and maybe having little mini lectures um, like the kinds of things that go on within our centers. Center or psychology law is brilliant with regard to. And if you want to bring the students in, start bringing them in when they're seniors. Bring them into these events when they're seniors so they're mm -hmm. used to doing it before they become alumni and you got to go chase after them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Jeff, you had a, an idea you wanted to share. Yeah, just a, a couple real quick. Uh, first and foremost, though, thanks for doing this. It's great to see you guys. I want to buy you guys a uh, night out with a fine dinner and some 
fine wine one of these times, either up in San Francisco with me or down there. So that'd be great. We can discuss where, where these grand in ideas. In San Francisco, where in San Francisco? Well, I know your tastes in food, Ray, so I'll make sure that I have my platinum card ready for that. Yeah. But the, uh, you know, I, I was struck by a couple things. They could be crazy ideas, but might as well. Um, first, um, I think it'd be in a marketing way, it might be good to embrace the uniqueness of social ecology, that with the undergraduates themselves, celebrate that you are indeed different because everybody else doesn't have a social ecology degree and get some energy around that. Uh, the second thing was just, uh, you know, it's fine to ask a senior citizen like me what will bring you back to campus, but uh, realistically, it'd probably be better to be asking some folks that are three or four years out of school about what would bring them back. And then, like was discussed before, talking to some current students about this topic, like what would bring you back here? What, what would make you want to contribute and still be part of this community? And just ask the folks, because I mean, it's nice with the old senior citizen like me, I got more money so I could potentially send you guys more money, but most people my age don't have a lot of energy to go with it. Unlike you two, of course, clearly. I mean, I'm talking about retiring and you guys are still going and, it's hard for me to envision, but the, uh, strong. you know, and then on the substance side, and maybe it was because my other degree there was in econ, but um, I, I am struck by the connection that you potentially could make in the, uh, what's happening in the uh, business world with uh, environmental social governance stuff and aligning your program with that uh, really expanding quickly area as a as a thing that you know we're asking companies to get more uh think about paradigms be more synergistic report in these different areas and it turns out those areas are what you guys were talking about when i took the class back in 78 so you know i i think those are a couple of things i just throw out there uh I, i'm a little leery of being called all the time even more because i went to cal they're calling me but I, but I do have data that I'd love to talk to you guys about because my daughter just graduated from Berkeley uh, a few months ago, and we're getting to watch how that's playing itself out too. So, uh, but I, I just really appreciate what you guys are doing here, and it's great to see you. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Thanks, Jeff. Jason, did you want to add anything from the dean's office side? Sorry, I wouldn't let me unmute. Um, yeah, I just wanted to say thank you guys for all your comments. Um, you know, part of my job is that I try to work with the alumni and there's a, a many different things that I've been wanting to do for a, for a while um, with regard to alumni in other regions, um, like some regional boards, a sort of uh, uh, just a group of people who in a very, in a certain area who are alumni. But again, we can't share contact information. We're sort of legally barred from, from doing that. So we're sort of, we like the idea of sort of saying, these are the people in your area, but we also need permission to share contact information. So that's one of those things that um, it sort of has been an obstacle for us doing what we want to do. Um, but this event has been fantastic. Uh, I really love all of your comments. I love all the, the stories. Um, and I am really looking forward to reaching out to a lot of you just to sort of get more of your ideas uh, and maybe to see if you would like to volunteer for something in your particular area. Um, so thank you all for coming. That was, this has been fantastic. I know you would set up the option for people to go into break rooms by the 70s, 80s, 90s, et cetera. But it seems like everybody kind of stayed in the main room, which was nice. And I think one thing that made it nice today, even though it took a little while to go around the room and have everyone speak, is that we could all see each other on one screen. When you get in these Zoom meetings and you're flipping galleries, it's it's a little tough. So, you know, we, we have to get better at how to do these, these online meetups, but it, it was nice today. And we're really glad you all joined us. Yes. Well, I'm just gonna appreciate the, the lasting mark you made on me. Three weeks before graduation ceremony, I was blocking for you in a football game and got smashed pretty good. <laughs> was stiff and sore it wasn't until two weeks after i graduated i found out i broke my collarbone 
Oh man. So I now have a lump right here. So every morning <laughs> I'm reminded of my time at Irvine. Yeah, well, I, I am too from those football games. I blew out my ACL and my right leg in one of those games. But, stepped in a hole. Uh, what's that? You, you yeah. stepped in a hole. That or I slipped on wet grass trying to make a tag. I don't know, but, you know. No, you, you stepped in a hole. Okay. <laughs> All I know is I was flat out. <laughs> I remember. Yeah. But, yeah, just rehabbed it, and you know. But, yeah, those were fun fun days. It, it was, it's been a real privilege being able to be in our school or program for all these years you know to see it evolve and grow I think Ray and I have been with the school for close to 50 years maybe 47 or 40, something like that you, you came in 74 I came in 73 but what a ride I mean when we came here right. uh, nobody knew what Irvine was going to become it had only been open since 1965 and it was it felt like a risky decision to come here to the program in social ecology but I guess Arnie Binder and Gil Geis and folks talked us up pretty good and we, we decided to take the, the plunge and here we've been all these years. Well, Dan Stokels was a re one of the main reasons I came here. Oh, well, we've, we've been buddies and football comrades and you know taught SE 200 together for a number of years. So it's, it's been a lot of fun and so many great memories working with all of you too. Well, thanks so much. Uh, I think the schedule was to do this from 11 to 1, and um, you, you all have very busy lives. <laughs> so um, I'm just here in my faculty office, and I've got some work in a master's class that I need to get underway myself. And, and feel free to email us and keep in touch. In fact, we'll, we'll try to get an email list together for, of all of you who participated so we can, we can stay in closer touch. Um, it's, it's been fascinating to hear what each of you are doing individually. This has been a very enjoyable two hours. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thanks, everybody, for putting it together. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you guys. Well.